Hello and welcome to another episode of Gotham Sound TV. Um, I am very excited to introduce you to David Herman. Dave, say hi to everybody. Hello. Um, we got to know Dave through his work um, with Stephen Dubner uh, Productions. Um, Dave is an audio podcast producer for the game show Tell Me Something I Don't Know. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. Um, I was going to say, tell me something I don't know, but that's that would be way too easy. No, tell me, tell me what your responsibilities are um, for the show. Yeah, uh, it's kind of evolved a bit um, since we first started piloting the show. We actually first piloted the show uh, when, as a part of uh, Freakonomics Radio at WNYC, mm -hmm. um, which is where I was working at the time, um, and it's evolved quite a bit since then. Um, but my responsibilities on the show um, have been mostly dealing with um, the all the technical elements, so um, making sure we get a good recording of the show. Um, I uh, actually wrote the theme music for the show. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then dealing with the post-production side of things. Uh -huh. So um, let, I guess let's go into it. Um, so tell, tell me about recording the show. What, uh, for those that haven't um, heard the show, um, how would you describe it? To you? So it's, uh, I like to think of it as Technically, it's kind of a game show. There is a game involved. There's a there's somebody who wins at the end of the night. But it's very much um, kind of like a, a parade of wonderful facts that come up from people uh, in the audience, people that have been submitted ideas and come to to each of our live events and participate. Um, it's taped in front of uh, in a in a theater in front of an audience. And when you say taped, it's it's audio only. Yeah, for audio only. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, and then. Yeah, it's a it's a, a game that happens up state on stage. Steven's there. He's kind of like the 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 host of the game show. Um, there's generally a panel uh, of pa uh, a panel of panelists, <laughs> um, kind of like judges, yep. um, who uh, hear the ideas that are brought to the game from uh, folks uh, that have submitted ideas and have come kind of like audience participants, although. Um, it's not just random people that come up from the audience. Sure. It's people that have, yeah. That, and if you hear the show, you get the sense. Right, exactly. I, I, I heard yeah, people this are prepared. Season yeah. two finale mm -hmm. where the woman brought the saw. Right. And I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That was okay. I got it. Yeah, yeah. that was a really fun one. Um, but uh, uh, and then uh, they go through this game over the course of the show, and uh, at the end of the show, there's somebody that comes out on top. Uh huh. And what? Are some of the challenges involved? In that? You make it sound very um, straightforward, but I imagine. Uh, um, well, uh, it's it's funny because um, there's generally it doesn't feel like there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, purely technically, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of sources, uh, a lot of you know, a lot of channels that you need. But we end up actually pushing usually to like. 18 channels that we're recording, which is kind of like just past the threshold to use yeah. like... 16 is always exactly, the magic number. Right, yeah, right. right. And you know, you want to, in case something, you know, so there's something that comes up that like, like there's a saw lady that comes up that you, you want to throw a mic on that, like you want to make sure you have a little bit of flexibility built into your rig to be able to add that in. Right. Uh, and, you, and we should, we'll link to this um, in the episode, but... Um, this is not just a saw lady. She is. She was like one of the preeminent. She's like one of the, the preeminent saw. Guinness Book of saw, World Record. Holders. Not sawyer. Saw sawists. That's, uh -huh. the, that's nice. the term. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. She's she was amazing. Um, uh, plays plays a beautiful saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, eight, eight. So eighteen mics. Um, no. Well, not all mics. 18 uh, yeah. Eighteen. Ch eighteen channels. So I'm also printing. Um, uh, a reference mix at the same time, a series reference mix, um, and you know, there's the mics on stage, the people that we hear, but I'm also doing usually two mics, uh, either uh, on the downstage edge, you know, audience mics, reaction mics, uh -huh. and then I'll usually have um, a stereo mic at the back of the house to sort of capture like the 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 acoustics of the room, kind of, just so we get a sense of what the space is like. Mm -hmm. So all that put together, uh, yeah, ends up being kind of like just just past like the threshold for you know uh, for yeah 16, 16 channels yeah. exactly it's funny everything comes in sort of groups of eight right and you're always pushing the next into the next group right. which uh, like you said I think it's good to have spares right, right. Um, how important is recording the audience um, you know how, how does that oh happen? yeah I mean that's you know we say really that you know it's a live show but really like you might have Anywhere between two and eight hundred people in, a, in an audience, depending on you know where where we're taping the show. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
really the audience of the show is you know all the people that are going to be downloading the podcast later on and we've definitely noticed like in on nights when <coughs> excuse me we had sort of a a medium audience in the house that translates to a show that feels like kind of medium, you know, like uh-huh. the energy, it's that energy of the live audience uh, that you really feel. So getting a good capture of that is really crucial, I think, to helping that all come across. And um, can we talk uh, geek specific yeah. for a second? So uh, what are your mic choices for the panelists and for the audience? We've done a few different things because sometimes, you know, when we travel, different companies will have, uh, you know, different gear available to to us, um, but typically we're doing some kind of. Um, actually, at this point, we're now doing three. We're usually doing like two shotguns, stage left and right, um, and that varies between Chefs and Sennheisers usually. Yep. Um, and then uh, we'll have a usually a cardioid center stage uh, to capture, get a, just to fill out the image a little more in the middle. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean stereo is 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 really nice for this, um, but also too wide of a stereo, too much stereo. Um, when you're starting to deal with MP3 compression, you start right. to notice a lot more of the artifacts, and um, it just yeah. So so it's generally pretty. We try to keep it pretty tight, but you do want a little bit of the air to mm-hmm. feel like you're in a live event, especially if you're listening with headphones. And and for panelists, do you have a, a go-to mic for them? Uh, it, again, it depends. Um, I mean. Lately, what we've been doing is we've been putting them on uh, uh, DPA 4066s. So um, we started off using handheld mics for everybody, and that just got a little too complicated just because of like the geometry of the stage. People were like looking left and right, and they would kind of go off mic and stuff like that. Right. So um, yeah, so we said we'll just put them on headsets and and it creates a little bit of a panic moment at the very beginning of the show because they actually come on stage. During the show, they they don't and and they're uh, I should also say that they're wired, so we don't you know they're sitting in chairs the whole time. So right. for reliability's sake, we just wire them up. Sure. Um, and uh, uh, so they come on stage during the show. Stephen kind of like pauses the action of the show. It's not a live show, so we have a little bit of flexibility where he can say like, okay, we're taking a minute. We're gonna get these guys set up in their mics. Do a quick like test one two one two. Um, but uh, so there is kind of like this rushed moment of like with an audience of several hundred people looking at me, I've got to like right. adjust a 4066. Your moment to yeah, shine. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, so that's yeah, that's generally what we're using for the panelists. It's changing a little bit now because actually the format of the show is is evolving a little bit. We're moving from three panelists to actually just like. A co-host, so Stephen and a co-host, we're experimenting huh. with sort of a smaller, smaller footprint of people on stage, right. um, and in that situation, because it's not going to be so much people looking all over the place, we might go back to handhelds. For that. And specifically for flow, just to keep the flow going. Yeah, I mean, it, you can set them up, you know, beforehand. You right. can, you know, before the audience comes in, you can have them sit at their chair. You can adjust the boom and get it right where they need it, and uh, yeah, that nice. works pretty well. Um, and just for the sake of completeness, for the audience mics, shotguns, um, you mentioned Sheps and Sennheiser, mm-hmm. I assume the CMID and the 416? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's generally what we're using, yeah. Nice. And for the back of the house, anything? Uh, I use a VP88 uh-huh. uh, for just a you know simple MS. So uh, let's talk about recorders. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to know you um, through renting the uh, 970 sound device mm-hmm. 970. Um, why that? Why that recorder? And do you record to anything else? Uh, so, uh, like I said, the the because we're sort of just past 16 channels, we needed something that could handle a lot of tr- a lot of cha- uh, a lot of input channels, um, and we also wanted to have a backup going. Um, while, uh, yeah, we just wanted to have backup going because I'm, you know, nervous all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, because of that, Dante seemed like the most efficient way to do that, um, as just from the sake of like not having to carry a ton of copper to split things out and um, go through all of that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we end up using the uh, the. 970, or actually maybe I think the 260 right. is what we're actually using, but uh, you know, basically Sound the same thing. Yeah. Dante recorders. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, a, a primary and a redundant uh, switch, mm-hmm. um, and uh, 
So our, our sound devices is our backup recorder, technically, um, and our main recorder is uh, a laptop running Pro Tools. And um, Pro Tools, you know, I think makes everybody go like, oh god, you're doing a live show with Pro Tools? Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> and the only reason I feel comfortable doing that is because I have the sound devices unit running at the same time, which I know could, you know, take a nuclear warhead. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also recording to, you know, redundant media internally. Um, and so are you going Dante Virtual Sound Card into Pro Tools? Yeah, exactly. Dante Virtual Sound Card into Pro Tools. Got it. Um, and then uh, we'll usually have either um, something like a Behringer X32 mm -hmm. as kind of like the front end for the, you know, doing all the conversion, the preamps and the conversion. Yep. Um, we've also used a Yamaha QL1, which I really like. Yes. Um, a little more flexible in terms of the routing. Yep. Um, and the preamps pre sound very nice. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that's that's the basic setup is into a small format console with the Dante card out to uh, the sound devices and the Pro Tools rig at the same time. Nice. That sounds very clean and, and compact. It's really compact. It's really straightforward. Um, it's flexible. It also lets me, um, like, you know, I also run uh, uh, playback cues off of a separate laptop, uh -huh. um, so I can use, uh, you know, I can use uh, Dante Virtual or is it DVS for that? Yeah, DVS for that to as a two, ch you know, a two channel sure, interface, sure, sure. Um, uh, so I can go right into the network that way for the playback. And that I think dovetails nicely into um, uh, PA work. So you're you're are you making the mix for the front of house as well? No, generally not. Usually we'll have a local house crew that's dealing with the you know live audio side of things. Uh -huh. um, Do they get a split of your mics, a Dante split or an? Analog we'll split? usually use. So I'll usually set up at monitor land in mm -hmm. our venues, mm -hmm. and then I'll use the house split, or you know we'll rent a, uh, an ISO split. Um, so the split is analog between right. front of house and me. And then for me, I take that in to Dante and split it out to our uh, primary and backup recorders that way. And do you get concerned at all with um, uh, sort of front of house levels bleeding into your recording mics? Like, do you, obviously the audience yeah. participation is huge, right. but is there any contention there? No, I mean, I think the only time we really run into, um, uh, the only time it becomes a concern is with we do sometimes put monitor wedges on stage, so mm -hmm. we have to deal with that, um, especially if we're using the 4066s, which are Omnis, you know, you've got that to, to deal with. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if we have any kind of feedback issues, you know, that's the only time when it really becomes a concern. In, uh, in terms of PA leaking into the mics, it kind of adds, I think, to the ambience of, got it. you know, the feeling, the feeling of it being of a live show. event. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess before we get into production, I do want to um, talk, post-production rather, mm -hmm. I do want to talk a little bit about um, what else, what sort of things keep you awake? Obviously you have redundant <laughs> recordings, but yeah. you know, like what what do you um, stress about? Uh, widgets, having all the adapt, like making sure I have all the right adapters uh -huh. <laughs> and all the little like things. Um, Steven has taken to using uh, uh, headphones on stage instead of relying on a, on a wedge mix. He likes to have a set of headphones, huh. um, and I think it, it comes from being in a radio studio a lot. And he's very he's just very comfortable with a set of seventy five oh sixes on his head. Sure. Um, and uh, he's got a little headphone amp, and like you know, making sure I've got like I know what the input the thing's going to take, and making oh. sure I have all the adapters. So I just always get like way more adapters than I'll ever need, turnarounds and, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, also not knowing like what is going to be at the house, or going to be in the house um, in terms of like some places have a ton of batteries, and they're just like, yeah, you can use our batteries. And some places they're like, what's a battery? And right. I'm <laughs> like, I need to have a battery. This, is, this sounds very much like the world I'm familiar with, yeah. where you're a uh, production sound mixer and you're an island. So you yeah. know, if you don't bring it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, so, so really that's the thing that keeps me up as, at night, is like, have I gotten all like the tiny little things that if I forget it, like there was one show that we did in uh, Chicago where I left my um, uh, Thunderbolt to Ethernet uh, uh -huh. adapter in the in the house yeah. where we were staying, yeah. and uh, I can't run. 
Dante Virtual Sound Card into a computer that has no Ethernet port. Right. It is uh, one downside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, we like had to have somebody like run out to the closest Best Buy and yeah. and get another one. Um, which which is kind of amazing, you know, that we live in that age. Yeah. Uh, that you know, I mean, it used to be like you could go to Radio Shack and solder stuff, uh, but now it's like Amazon uh, Amazon Now. Oh right? yeah, exactly. Like it, we can solve it. Yes. Yeah. So definitely, uh, those are those are the things that keep me up at night. So, um, so, so that leads me to the question of: uh, Are there production tools that are under a hundred dollars that you just cannot live without? Well, this uh, probably more on the post production side okay. uh, for myself, and um, because I mean, tell me something I don't know is the only show I work on. I also mix a lot of shows and. Uh, produce some shows and write music for shows. So I've got, um, and I'm often working in an environment like a like a non-ideal listening environment, so I've got headphones on all the time. <laughs> um, a set of uh, deep ear cups for my 7506s changed my world. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> because a 7506 is, I think technically, I don't know if they, if they sell it as um, an over-ear, on-the-ear uh, headphone. Uh-huh. But the way my ears are shaped, I'm getting like pressure like right here. Yep. And if I've got a set of those headphones on for like four or five hours, you know, at a time, or maybe not not at a stretch, but over the course of a day, I'll have a set of headphones on for six or seven hours. My ears like start to feel like they're gonna fall off. Yeah. And so I bought like a thirty-five dollar pair of they're maybe like three quarters inch deep or something, and they just re take off the stock. Ear yeah. cups, and you put those on, and it just like lifts the 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 driver, you know, off your ear, you know, just a little bit, so that there's no pressure there. Change my world. That's amazing. <laughs> we'll have to get a link. Yeah. Uh, all right, and and share. That's awesome. Uh, uh, very cool. Um, what responsibilities do you have um, for post production when you're recording the shows? Um, so. Yeah, file management is one part of it. So making sure that um, you know I've got my backup recordings for as long as I need them, and you know the primary recordings all uh, I know where they are and I've got to manage. Um, the editing process uh, for the show goes through a lot of different um, sets of hands, or at least a couple of different sets of hands. It's, we're trying to streamline it a little bit, but uh, you know it, it definitely goes through. Um, Kind of somebody who's editing for content, and then somebody who's sort of cleaning it up to make sure that that it sound good, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of going through a mix. Hmm. Um, Not unlike uh, the way a film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Works. for sure, for sure. Actually, and we're we're starting to play around with that system a little bit, also, where we're we're um, you know uh, actually going through and mixing the raw tape first, hmm. printing stems, and then have the content edit be done on stems as opposed to on the full multi-track. Uh -huh. um, so that's been, you know, that's been helping, I think, streamline things a little bit for us. Um, but in any case, however it works, um, my role has been kind of managing that process, so making sure that the session, uh, for whoever needs it needs to get passed off to next in the process, uh, the session is prepped and ready to go for that person. So if it's going to the person who's editing, you know, doing like the content edits, it's laid out in the Pro Tool session, but all of the um, sort of like the mix routing and stuff is kind of simplified in a way that it's not going to get in the way of their editing process. Um, and then once that's finished, uh, I'm making sure all of the um, sort of the, the post production cues, like kind of sound moments, like uh, if we have interstitial music or the mm -hmm. theme and stuff like that, like the structure of the show is uh, kind of set so that when it goes to the mix phase, um, all that stuff's in place and the mixer doesn't have to guess at like, well, do they want music here? Do they not want music here or something like And is that, that with markers in Pro Tools? Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'll go in and I'll like throw the cue here, I'll throw the cue. I'll, I'll, I'll play stuff in the timeline and just kind of get things uh, assembled in a way that they can just sort of be that they can just be mixed from there as opposed to having sort of like a hybrid edit mix kind of phase. Got it. Um, something I've always been curious about is do you guys mix a show like uh, Tell Me Something I Don't Know, mm -hmm. do you mix it um, with the intended audience in mind? For example, um, podcasts, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think podcasts 
um, people listening to them are often doing something else while they're listening. Oh yeah, to them. for sure. And do you take that into account when you're mixing? Absolutely, them? yeah. Um, one thing that's started to gain traction uh, re- recently, as podcasting has become a little more professionalized, um, there's this idea of uh, maybe we should have some standards for like how podcasts get right. put out. Right. Um, you know, taking a cue from the film world, where you you know film audio, where you've got you know you've got level standards. Right. You know, in terms of so. Um, there's no laws about it right now and there's no and also from you know broadcast television where you've got um you know the com act exactly and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. yeah yeah so um there are no rules about it right now it's still very much the wild west but there are big players in the game who are putting out the most popular content who are starting to agree amongst themselves like oh, okay we should try to like you know find some kind of good you know middle ground and so that's one part of it is making sure that you know, our content uh, feels right next to other content that somebody might be right. uh, listening to, whether it's another podcast or it's music on their phone or something like that. Um, and then the other consideration is the listening environment that they're in, which is like you said, they might be doing the dishes or in an office or something, or they might be on the subway mm-hmm. um, or driving in their car or something like that. And um, f- personally, my strategy for that has been uh within reason trying to limit dynamic range um so uh to the point where you know to the point where i can i'm usually mixing uh, a show to i mean my the, the sort of generally accepted um standard for public radio at this point for pod for digital delivery not for the broadcast side mm-hmm. um is uh, minus 16 lufs and so let's talk about that. What, yep. what does LUFS mean? <laughs> uh, so my, I'm certainly not a, not a physicist and not a, not a, um, a whatever. But even if you engineer talked about it, it in terms of like if you set it to minus eight LUFS as opposed to minus, what, what, what is it, what is it doing? So uh, loudness, the way I like to think of loudness is kind of like, it's kind of like volume. It's kind of like the volume knob on your on your stereo, um, but tailored a little more specifically for how we hear, uh, mm-hmm. how we perceive sound. So that, um, you know, you might have uh, on, on, if your volume knobs turned up, you might have a very low sound and a very high sound that are, you know, technically they're, they're registering the same, like the same little LED on your meter, but they might sound totally different because we just don't hear all frequencies the same. Sure. So uh, Lufs takes that into consideration a bit uh, in, in the metering process um, huh. and helps um, helps things feel if if the numbers are more if the numbers are consistent the feel should be consistent is kind of the way I, I like to think of it. And so when you're mixing, you have a um, a plugin I, I presume that shows. Yeah, so I'll use um, I'll usually use a combination because and there's not a good reason. It's just it's just taste. I think mm-hmm. um, I'll usually use a combination of um, uh, the um, Waves loudness meter uh, and uh, isotope insight, yeah. um, and there's not a good reason for this. It's just my own quirks. Yeah, uh, is that I will mix to minus twenty four actually, which is kind of which is like the broadcast uh, coming into its own as the broadcast standard. Uh-huh. I'll mix to minus twenty four and then apply. Uh, uh, basically, a limiting stage that's bumping things up to minus sixteen. Uh-huh. You know, essentially adding roughly eight dB of, of sort of compre- bringing uh, it up and compressing mostly it's. It I mean, and I'm trying to mix. I'm trying to mix before compression with a small enough dynamic range that the limiter isn't doing too much in terms of actually changing the dynamics. Mm-hmm. But it, when it needs to, it can, and mm-hmm. it won't push it so hard. So, so yeah. I mean, the idea is like limiting dynamic range, but helping it feel natural. I mean, I think public radio. Which is kind of where I come from in terms of my my broadcast background, um, has an aesthetic. It has a very um, natural, uncompressed kind of aesthetic, contrasted to FM radio or, God forbid, AM radio. <laughs> um, and and that's something that you know, uh, being a podcast that comes out of the public radio uh, ecosphere. Uh, we try to carry that through. So, so yeah, I think it's about limiting dynamic range without uh, without too much compression. And there are other tools, you know, that I use for that. I've been using um, uh, what you call it, a uh, Wave Rider recently a uh-huh. lot, um, where um, you know I'll kind of 
it'll it'll help me kind of do a pass on say a you know a vocal tr vocal track or something like that um, to kind of even things out a little bit, and then I can apply a little bit of compression after the fact that can be a bit more gentle. Um, and uh, and then my final limiting stage. My final limiting stage then again doesn't have to be as intense. Uh, and what about during uh, re recording? Any any? Do you print with any limiting or compression or? No, we're going pretty dry. Uh -huh. um, all of our. I'm trying to think. Yeah, no, we don't do any processing. Uh, yeah, to tape. And during the show, how involved are you um, in terms of like if somebody's popping their, their mic to, oh, yeah. to sort of jump yeah, yeah. in. We'll, we'll definitely, um, you know, if if needs be, um, we can, it's not a live thing, so we can stop the show um, if there's something really egregious. Um, you know, we try to set things up before the show as much as we can so that we don't run into problems that we sure. can't easily deal with in post-production. Um, you know, we have had to swap out a headset mic, you know, that mm -hmm. felt like the element was going bad. Um, yeah, stuff like that. And stuff on the edge, I always wonder about. Like, if somebody has dry mouth, do you, do you like say, you know, you might want to some water? Like, how do you? Yeah, uh, we like have, how deep? How deep do you? We have. I mean, we certainly have run into people. I mean, there are some people who just have very soft speaking voices, even mm -hmm. when they're in front of uh, a crowd of people, and that there's not a ton you can do about it. Right. So you just right. deal with it. Yeah. Um, we haven't had any dry mouthers, which is good, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Uh, not that I can remember. I'm trying to think of other folks. Placement becomes an I mean, when you're using the headset mics, placement becomes a real issue because, you know, too far back and you'll get their jaw kind of muffling right. everything. Oh, um, I have had to ask uh, someone to remove their um, earrings because it'll be <sighs> clacking. You know, if they have like bangly earrings on, it'll be clacking against the microphone and we'll hear sure. that. So. Um, so yeah, little things like that to try to help if we can. Cool, good. Um, and more generally, uh, you do other kinds of podcasts besides live mm -hmm. shows. Yeah, yeah. What what other podcasts do you, do you work on or have you worked on? Yeah, uh, a, a bunch. Um, so for companies like um, Gimlet Media, mm -hmm. they have a show called Startup, which uh, I mix. Um, oh, yeah. There's yeah. Um, uh, another... Uh, so Scripps um, is a company that um, is, they're sort of more known for like television news and things like that, but they've started to get into the podcast world. Uh, yeah, we now. deal with a lot of um, nonfiction stuff that they do, yeah. home, home improvement and uh -huh. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they've, they actually, um, they, through, uh, they, they acquired this company called um, Midroll, which was is a podcast, they're an ad sales company, which has kind of a, a content piece of uh -huh. there called Earwolf. They do a lot of comedy podcasts. Um, Let's let's talk about that. I'm yeah, curious. big fish swallowing little yeah, fish. Because no, uh, a couple of years ago, podcasts like were you know not were not everywhere. Yeah, um, it was you know sort of considered um, not an esoteric thing to listen to, but like you know you were niche old fashioned thing, for sure, yeah. kind of thing. And and now. Um, you know, it is uh, the equivalent of Sopranos. Like everybody talks, comes yeah. in and talks about. Did you hear this? Did you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it's you know, I think serial definitely was a thing that that kicked things off for people. I mean, podcasts had started to become a thing before that, mm -hmm. um, and had started to gain some traction, but serial was the first uh, podcast to produce listener numbers that you know were starting to look more like television than right. radio. I mean, I I, I guess um, Stephen said uh, four million downloads for for um, tell me something I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm I'm I haven't checked the numbers in a while, but that doesn't surprise me. I mean, Freakonomics Radio regularly pulls in I think four to five million listeners a month. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I imagine some advertisers. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the kind of thing where suddenly there's people listening, which means that okay. Advertise or people with an advertising budget are like, oh, this is a place where we want to park some dollars. Um, I, I joke to, half joke to a lot of people that like if you know Squarespace and Mailchimp ever go out of business, <laughs> I'm gonna be out of a job. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> there are like a couple of companies that really specialize in podcast advertising. Yeah. Um, or at least they they're very present in in the podcast world. Super captive audience. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me, you know, I grew up listening to Howard Stern and mm -hmm. like when he would read commercials over the air, 
Like that's sort of what yeah. it harkens back to. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, it's, it's back to the future in some For ways. sure, yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing is like they, it's a place where it's, um, it's okay for, uh, or I mean okay in quotes, for like the host of a show to like just come on and pitch a product, right. you know, at a certain point. And, you know, there are obviously there are companies and there are people that try to be conscious that when they're doing it, like, you know, they're doing it. It's not just... Um, Startup was good at that, I think. Right, Startup Alex, did that, and right. Reply All is, yeah. you know, the, the, actually their whole company, Gimlet as a company is, you know, generally they... I mean, it's interesting because for them, they produce a lot of their ads as little mini stories, so they make them fun to listen to, but at the same time, they're also very clear that, like, this is distinct from our program. Right. Um, you know, the other side of it also is is the branded content side, which is now becoming even more of a player. And lots of people want, you know, their own podcast series for their company, branded from their company. And it's either not necessarily always just like talking about the company, but mm -hmm. talking about tangential, something tangential that sort of relates to the company. Like um, GE uh, sponsored a, a podcast called The Message uh, not too long ago, and they had a follow-up called... Um, that's the name is escaping me, but uh, huh. it's it was basically um, they they the show was kind of um, it was a fictional show, uh, and it had some science and technology themes in it, but it was just branded as being part of I think they called it the GE Podcast Theater, which felt very cool and old fashioned to me. Yeah, uh, I mean that's that is um, I don't think it was GE that had that. It was um, Ford or somebody had the theater. Uh, uh, CBS Live TV what was called the CBS Radio Workshop, but there was um, it was like a soap company, right? Yeah. It was yeah. oh, it was um, Procter and Gamble. Or yeah, it was something. Procter and Gamble. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. It was Procter and Gamble, and that's where the term soap opera comes from. Yes, uh, yes, it, because that's it right. was these this company, you know, uh, sponsoring huh. and and you know, advertising for Downey Snow or whatever <laughs> in between. When you do um, <laughs> or Ivory the, Snow. That's uh, the podcasts that are um, sort of more maybe documentary in nature. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tools and the techniques that you use? Um, so uh, small, like por small portable uh, recording rigs are um, really commonly used, um, and generally you're looking at uh, little handheld two-track recorders like the Zoom H5 or H4 or H5. Mm -hmm. um, Task cams, Marantz, um, and then uh, the new sound devices, and and um, yeah, uh, this is this yeah, this is a plug, but it's a it's a good plug. Uh, the, the new mix pre's. I was those. I was actually going to say yeah, I mean that seems like um, I haven't looked at what the price point of those is, but um, you know if it it seems like oh man, this is amazing that that they're they've got something that you know the three channel with you know the integrated recorder and and. Uh, that seems like it could be a really great solution for yeah. something like this. Yeah. Um, and uh, generally, people are using shotgun mics to record audio in the field. Um, just if you're out and about and you want to interview somebody, it's a nice way to kind of isolate as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, the NTG2 is a popular choice because it's really inexpensive, although. Not, no knock on road. I mean, it's not my favorite mic. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. sure. Um, I've um started using the um what is it the uh me 66 which is pretty mm -hmm. nice um and inexpensive ish um would you ever put a wireless mic on somebody if we have just a done that mm -hmm. um actually we did a really fun episode of freakonomics a long time ago um where uh we do you remember that show, Sleep No More? Uh, it actually might still be going on. No. Um, oh, yeah, Sleep No More. Yeah. Uh, so we. T tell me about it. So it's it's, it's this um, it's this kind of immersive theater experience where um, there's three or four floors of a building in Chelsea where they set up different, um, you know, different uh, uh, scenes. Like it's 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 people that are. It's all it's a uh, it's. Um, Immersive I, theater. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I'm trying to think of how British better to, uh, company. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's yeah. a British company, um, and uh, it's it's, it's based around amazing. Macbeth. Yeah, it's all it's Macbeth, and it's um, uh -huh. you never in the the story is never like told. You don't nobody ever like comes out and reads all the lines to you, but they're sort of like 
existing in these environments of the play and you kind of walk around through it and it's really um they've sort of expanded it into this whole like culture of like musical performances and they have a bar there and the bar sort of exists in a restaurant rooftop restaurant. it's a whole thing now it's amazing um but uh we did a show an episode of freakonomics about it um at one point and we actually went there and we interviewed um some of the creators of the show uh-huh. and um uh, I, I heard. I heard. That oh, episode. cool! Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and that was really fun because we we had um, Stephen and uh, a couple, of the, the director and one of the performers, a couple of the performers actually, and we just put him on um, forty sixty sixes and uh, electrosonics transmitters, and mm-hmm. I followed him around with a seven eighty eight and uh-huh. uh, and a receiver, and you know. They just got to walk around and talk and do whatever they wanted to do, and I just kind of followed around and make sure I was in reception range. Nice, <laughs> and, then, yeah. and it all and it was it was a really fun interview. It was really nice for them to not have to be like tethered to microphones or anything like that. They just kind of do whatever they, they just wanted, were and they were in the space, and, and that's yeah. it's just nice. It's a nice, nice way to do it. Um, <clears throat> so for things like that, uh, people use wireless, but generally people are using you know wired mics and uh, and portable recorders. And for, um, you know, like we, we deal with companies that want to um, create content, like a couple of people talking around a desk. We deal with um, a law firm uh, that just wanted to talk about legal issues and make a podcast out of it. Mm-hmm. What, what would you do for that kind of stuff? Um, well, if you want, I mean, if, if it were on site, like in their offices. Mm-hmm. Um, or conference think, room or Yeah, something. or conference or something like that. Um, I think, uh, you know, portable recorders are definitely the way to go for that, um, as opposed to bringing in a computer or something. Um, and uh, yeah, you could do. Um, I mean, the headsets are great just because you never have to worry about um, you know noise on the lapels, and it doesn't matter how it looks. You know, because right. you're never going to see it anyway. Right. Um, so, so those are really great if you can if you can get them. Um, I've done. I've done a conference style, a couple of conference style recordings where we actually um, set up uh, a couple, just like set up a bunch of, um, what did we use? Oh, this was a long time ago. I can't even remember which mics we used, but it was basically cardioid mics. And we just set up a bunch of them around a table and we kind of mix them together uh, mm-hmm. later on. Um, for, I mean, for, uh, you know, kind of your more standard like interview format show, like just like a two way interview kind of thing. Um, people are using a lot of things. I, one mic that I like, especially um, for uh, you know small budget uh, studios, is the um, the AT forty forty, which super clean, um, really just kind of a very neutral sounding mic, um, pretty forgiving and really inexpensive, and uh, yeah, it works. It works pretty well. A lot of people use SM sevens, um, which are Good, but really hard to drive. You need a really nice preamp to yes. be able to drive those. Yeah, and they're heavy too, right? They're yeah, they're heavy. I mean, if they're sitting, you're sitting on a boom arm or something yeah. like that. Um, I mean, yeah, these aren't mics where I'm like sitting there like holding. These are ones that are you know something where I'd be setting them up you know, right, right, on a right. table. Um, but uh, so yeah, so those are. I mean, it's pretty basic. Um, yeah, we try to keep it as simple as we can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there are, I mean, there are studios. I've done some setting up small podcast studios for companies um, where we'll set them up with um, something a little more elaborate because so, they'll maybe need a lot of, uh, a few different sources. So, like, they'll need to bring in a phone. Right. They'll have a second computer that's either, like, playback or they're running um, Skype connection or, right. like, uh, ISDN over IP kind of a thing. Um and so, in those situations, we'll usually I'll usually have uh, a mixing console set up um, that has. A, I usually do a small digital console where I can build all the mix minuses and stuff. You know, it's kind of under the hood, and then all they have to do is put a fader up, right. and it shows up in Pro Tools, which is super um, super convenient. For them. Yeah, exactly. Um, from it, it's funny because um, the from the broadcast side. People are very used to people that have come from radio are very used to broadcast consoles where everything's post fader. Like nothing goes into no, nothing gets recorded or goes to air unless the fader's up. Uh-huh. So um, so for some of the consoles actually, that's been a little like I've had to do a little bit of um, acrobatics. Like the the Midas M32 is one that I use uh, sometimes for that, and you actually have to like in order to like get audio routed to the USB card post fader, you have to first assign it to like the personal monitor system and then it can go to the, it's 
anyway. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, so yeah, but it, but it's nice that people can be like, all right, I put my fader up. There's stuff going to Pro Tools. I push it up a little more. It's louder. I took take it down. It's softer, and it's it's just a very simple, easy to follow signal flow. Got it. Um, any anybody have any uh, questions? Any anything? I have, I have one that's very general, but yeah. where do you, as a producer, uh, find inspiration for podcasts that you're producing? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess it depends on what um, what part of the pro because I do do work on in several different parts of the process. Sometimes, like sometimes I'm just mixing. Sometimes I'm writing music. Sometimes I'm producing. Um, for if I'm mixing, usually the inspiration is my deadline. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> I guess always my inspiration is my deadline. Um, music is a little more fun to think about in that way because um, I can, you know, we can kind of build a palette out for you know the kinds of sounds that we want to use. And you're a composer as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that and also i mean also on the sound design side it's nice we can we can kind of build out a palette you know um of instruments but also like sort of a, a, a for any particular show it might have its own kind of balance of like how much field tape do we use versus how often do we go to narration or interviews mm -hmm. in uh in a studio or something like that so um those are fun <laughs> those are fun those are the fun things to sort of figure out about the sound of a show right um for for tell me something i don't know uh you know, the playing with figure, figuring out what the sound of the music was going to be um, ultimately kind of influenced the the pacing of the way the final show was edited a little bit. Like it's very energetic, kind of um, it's very fast moving, kind of a kind of a edit compared to the live show. Um, so so yeah, it, it's it's cool that they can all kind of feed into each other a little bit. And season two's finale of Tell Me Something I Don't Know, that had its own unique challenges with right. like music. It was oh, all yeah, about yeah. music. Right. The show was about music and uh, featured a live band uh, right. on stage. Dan Zanes. Dan Zanes, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that was really, really fun. You know, obviously necessitated a lot more uh, a lot more input channels. We were also doing that show at the Skirball Center, which was fantastic because their house crew... Well, a lot of uh, most of the house crews that we've been doing shows at are incredible. Those guys are fantastic, uh -huh. um, and they uh, they have a really nice mic closet uh, uh -huh. in the house. Um, so so that helped. so we yeah we were we were very set up uh, microphone wise uh, awesome. for for what we needed to do there. How much of that miking of the musical stuff do you let them get on with and in, in tag? I mean, I I they sent you know they have their their specs of what they have in house, and from there I kind of chose like okay, let's do let's do this this and this. Um, if one wasn't available, I'd kind of be like, well, what do you think? What do you you know? I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that um, you know I I. I care about within a set of like stress parameters for myself right. and then outside of those stress parameters I'm like let's just make it work yeah. <laughs> um, I assume um, you're renting um, for uh, you've been renting now for the season three um, can you talk about when that's going to premiere so season three just uh, launched on June 4 uh, with the first episode and um, yeah we'll be doing I can't remember how many episodes there are in season three uh, off the top of my head, but they're coming out every week. So um, yeah, and we'll week. have links to the website, and yep. people should ab everybody should absolutely yep. check them out. And uh, if people are in New York, um, the uh, we're doing a few more live tapings up at Symphony Space, uh, June 9, 10, and 15, 16, um, and all that info is on tmsidk.com. Nice. Thank you so much thank for you. coming out. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for watching. As always, please visit the video archives at gothamsound.tv. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and send your ideas or questions for uh, and ideas about new episodes to info at gothamsound.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks to the crew. Have a good week.